Good morning. I confess that I'm not wearing a name tag. I'm one of those people. Uh, but I am Crystal Curgis, uh, a longtime member and part of the Riverside family, and very happy to be so. For those of you who may be new or who are watching and wonder if we had a big vote on revamping the decoration of our church, uh, this is not permanent. It is VBS week, and we are at a deserted island, otherwise known as the front two rows of the congregation, um, <clears throat> which is how it is at every church, so we're, we're normal. We, we fit the pattern perfectly. Um, welcome. It's a great morning. It's beautiful out. And if while we were listening as we prayed, you did not hear the voice of the children downstairs and the voice of the baby in the back and know that you were hearing the Spirit of God, then you didn't hear everything that you could have heard this morning because that was beautiful and lovely and delightful. The question that we had today when we were visiting was, what are you passionate about? And uh, I visited with little Grace. I get all excited and passionate about how Grace comes every Sunday morning very put together. The headband, the dress, the shoes, everything. And I asked her if she planned that, and she said no. So it just happens on her own. But aside from Grace's put-togetherness, I am very passionate about and love, and those of you who know me might know this, about books and words. I own approximately 5,000 books, and I get rid of many every month so that I have space to put the new ones in. I love everything about books themselves. I love everything about language and words. In my mind, I do some writing, but not the fun kind of writing, but in my mind, I have a hundred first lines of the next best amazing American novel, only I would rather that it be a dead British author novel because they're always better. But I have words floating around through my head all the time and they uh, make me passionate. The best first line that I could come up with in my mind, though, would never compare to the first lines that already exist in great literature. For example, in a hole in a ground, there lived a hobbit. You already want to read the book. I trust that you already have. And if you haven't, we can talk about that. Another great first line, it was a dark and stormy night. Madeline Lingle's uh, Wrinkle in Time. This is a great one. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Who knows it? Oh, come on. Yeah, it's Pride and Prejudice. It's very late to 1700s, isn't it? But it's such a beautiful line. It doesn't really roll off your tongue, but you're like, I got to know what this is all about. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive, we're very proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Half of you know what that is. There was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> Voyage of the Dawn Treader, a life-changing book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a great first line. And how about this one? Anoki, Yahweh, Eloheka, right to left in Hebrew. Anoki, Yahweh, Eloheka. You may not recognize it, but in our Bibles, these are the first words that God spoke to the people of Israel as a nation, as a group, audibly we think out loud so that they heard them. And in our Bibles, they are translated like this. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, took you out of slavery, but in the Greek, it loses a little with the, the Lord. It just says, I am Yahweh, your God. I am Yahweh. We translate as the Lord in our Bibles with the capital L-O-R-D, but it's his name. It is his personal name. I am Yahweh, your God, which is such a personal statement. To give your name to someone Name Tag Sunday, it's about getting to know people personally. When God gives his name and introduces himself by his name, it is extraordinarily personal. If you have a King James Version Bible uh, laying on a shelf somewhere, if you grew up with it, you might see Jehovah sometimes where it is Yahweh. That was how it was translated for a while. But every time you see the Lord with the capital L-O-R-Ds, in your mind read Yahweh as someone's name and see how it changes for you. The first words that God spoke to the entire nation of Israel, he had spoken to people before. He spoke to Abraham, told him to leave his land and go to the land that he was calling him to. He'd spoken to Isaac, he'd spoken to Jacob, he'd spoken to Moses before saying, I'm gonna use you to get my people out of Egypt, out of slavery. 
and he'd spoken to the people through Moses, this is what you're going to do on the night that I am going to bring this final plague onto the Egyptian people. Your people are going to do this. So Moses had been the mouthpiece of God for a long time, but now God is speaking to the people directly. So I am going to read to you the first words of God to the people, and I would love for you to just listen. These are taken from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to substitute some words that may sound more familiar to you with the words that they actually are in Hebrew. Verse 1, then God gave the people all of these words. I am Yahweh, your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or any image or anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I am. Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and the fourth generations of those who neglect me and reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God, Yahweh will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord, Yahweh, your God. And on that day, no one in your household may do any work. And this includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners who might be living among you. For in six days, Yahweh made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. And that is why Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. It's kind of interesting because at the beginning, it is Yahweh speaking. And then it switches into the third person. And he's talking about Yahweh, about himself. Um, and there's lots of reasons that that might be happening. We often refer to this passage that I just read to you as the beginning, the first half of the Ten Commandments, but in the Hebrew, they are called the words. God gave his people these words. Later, in another spot, these show up again later in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, and they are in one spot called the Ten Words of God, the Ten Messages, the Ten Sayings of God, which I love because for me... Words are my passion. Words are a gift. Language is a beautiful thing. God spoke things into existence. The turn of a powerful phrase, when you read a book and there's a sentence that just captures your attention and you can't let go of it because they so carefully put every word in exactly the right spot, in exactly the right order, and they used just the right words. Or the majesty of a beautiful lyric. Sometimes when we're singing a song, you'll come across a line and think, that's profoundly more than it looks like it is on the screen. Or a really powerful verb. Verbs are an amazing thing. Always look for the verbs. I'm just saying, that's where you want to look. Verbs are stupendous. So if you get words from God, then, they are especially beautiful and powerful. But here's the question I have for you about these words in Exodus 20. Very, very ancient words. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. What do we, 21st century followers of Jesus, do with these particular words that were spoken and written to a very specific group of people in a very specific context for a very specific purpose are these words for us today. These words were not for other ancient people. They were just for the Israelites. If the Moabites or the Ammonites didn't do what these words said, it really didn't matter because they weren't written to and for them. They were written to the nation of Israel very specifically. So are they written to us today too? Most Old Testament scholars, and for the last year and a half, I have been immersed in Old Testament scholarship for unknown reasons, except that I think 
Biblical Hebrew is a beautiful language, and something caught my attention, and then lo and behold, the last several sermons that I've been asked to do have been in the Old Testament. Isn't it funny how that works? But many people would say, absolutely, the Ten Commandments, as they are written, are very important, and we lift them high. I would say sometimes maybe even in an idolatrous way, like we worship them weirdly. Um, here's a couple images of them today. Here they are, written in modern English, actually in King James English, uh, and they have the American flag and the American eagle and then that weird creepy eye on the top. But here they are, and there are people who will fight to the death to keep this version of the ten words of God published and out in public display anywhere. Here's maybe a more familiar look where they're divided in half on two different stones that are neatly rounded at the top. Um, exactly the way that they should be. Um, oh, this is great. These are made out of resin, so they're much lighter and you can carry them around. Uh, I don't know what these cost on Amazon. And they're nicely compressed so that they all fit on the 10 things. They don't have all the words on them. They fit on the stones. And I guess because we know that in a 1,000 years we're going to be under Roman occupation, they use Roman numerals to mark <laughs> which ones are which. This is actually the only or the oldest version we have of the ten words of God being on a stone. And these were made after the life of Jesus by a group of people in Samaria. They were, post, they were up in a Samaritan um, synagogue or temple. They were done sort of to remember the ancient words. These are still old. They're hundreds, more than a thousand years old, but they are not from the time of the ten words of God. And that one stone weighs 200 pounds by itself. So we have all these pictures of Moses walking around really easily with one stone on each arm because obviously he did CrossFit all the time because stone is very heavy. And what was on the stones was probably more than just these 10 words. It was, if you read, these are part of a long, a long set of words that God was giving to his people. Anyway, those probably look more familiar to us. Before I think we can determine what these ancient 10 words mean for us today, I think we have to know what they were about when they were first written. So in the ancient Near Eastern world, the culture where the Israelites were, and at this point, they are a new nation. I mean, they've been in Egypt for 400 years, proliferating. There's a lot of them, but they don't have a land yet. They don't have a king they are sort of the rogue, new, young folks on the block. But there were a lot of other cultures that were very established by them. And they had many similar documents that we have evidence of. We have copies of them where there were laws about how to live so that things were orderly. I think that's where we get the phrase law and order. If you don't do these things, if you don't live this way, things are going to be disorderly. And nobody can live safely or hopefully or peacefully. So this is not the first time that they talked about, next week they will talk about some of the other ones about murdering and adultery. This is not the first place that those appear. They appeared in other things before this, but they usually appeared in treaties between a ruler, a human ruler, and a group of human people. And they would start with, I am Ramses II, who... Uh, brought you out of this land or who enslaved you or who, who took over your land and became your ruler. They would name it, who it is, and then they would say what they had done. Much like, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of slavery from the land of Egypt. It's a very common form for writing a treaty. And then here's the agreements about how you're going to live so that we have an orderly population and orderly community, and you do that, and then I'll take care of you, but here's the thing that's different. Ours are not written, the ones that we have in our Bible, between an earthly ruler and a group of people. They're written between a God and a group of people, and that is entirely new, entirely new. Up to this point, if you go back to Exodus 19, which Ralph talked about at the beginning of Exodus 19 last week, but if you read the rest of it, this is what you see. You've got Yahweh, and you've got the Israelites down here, and Moses is going back and forth, giving messages. God says, all right, tell the people this, and then we'll see what happens. And Moses would go and deliver the message, and the people would go, yep, we agree to that, and then Moses would go back. He was like parlaying between the two of them, like setting up a treaty between people, much like happens today in politics. 
That's exactly what the story looks like if you read it carefully. That's what's going on. So you've got Moses going back and forth until there's an agreement and God says, Yahweh says, all right, so we're good. Gather all the people. This is where they're going to be, what time, how they should dress, what they should do in preparation. And when they're there and it's the time, then I will meet with them and we're going to put this into action. Guidelines, sort of like today when we have the big treaty signings at the end of the war, right? There's all these agreements that you make and then there's a place and people get together and they sign it. Some people think that the idea of Moses coming down with two stones is that one was the copy for one party in the treaty and one was the copy for the other party in the treaty. I have no idea. I'm used to seeing one through five and six through 10, which makes sense to me, but I wasn't there and nobody took an Instagram and posted it, so I'm not entirely sure. Here's the reason there were not treaties or agreements or covenants between gods and people in the ancient Near Eastern world, except for Yahweh. Because the other gods weren't personal. And people didn't know what they were like and didn't know them. In other cultures, if something bad happened, you in your mind went, I have no idea why the God is mad at me, but the God is clearly mad at me, and I need to start doing stuff that I hope is going to make the God not mad at me anymore. And you would start sacrificing things or start cutting yourself. If you've ever read the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal had no idea what to do. They just went crazy to try and get Baal to do what they wanted, where our guy went, I will pray and ask for what I want to ask for, and then it's up to God from that point. But other people in other cultures felt like they could sort of control the God or get what they wanted, but they had no idea how. It was all a mystery. The gods demanded that humans served them. Sacrifices was so the gods could eat, um, so that they could procreate and have more gods. I mean, it was just an unknown relationship, and the people never really knew their gods, but every culture had a god. The Moabites had Chemosh, the Philistines had Dagon, the Babylonians had Marduk, the Ammonites had Molech, the Canaanites had Baal. The Israelites now, from his very voice, know that they have a God too. And his name is Yahweh. And he is personal, and he communicates with them, and he's relational, and he speaks clearly to them of who he is and what he offers and what he desires in return. So that they wouldn't have to run around like crazy people trying to guess what they needed to do to please their God. In this world, when these words were written, there were many gods. I'm not saying there actually were many gods, but in the view of the people who lived back then, there were many gods. And each nation had one, sometimes even every family had one. God does not begin his words with the Israelites by saying, there are no other gods except me. That would be almost unfathomable to them. He meets them where they are in the culture in which they live, which has many gods, and he says, I am your God. I, Yahweh, am your God, and you will not worship any of the other gods around you. He understood the culture that they lived in, and what they would be exposed to, and what they would be tempted to do, and that's what he speaks to. And by the way, that's what they did most of the time. If you read the Old Testament and the prophets, a lot of it is, you did it again. You've got poles to a she up on the top of the mountain, and you're worshiping her. Go take them down. She is not your God. Yahweh is your God. Simply telling them that he was their God and they shouldn't worship any other God did not make it what happened. But he was very aware of the fact that they would be tempted to worship other gods, and they did. So he doesn't say to them, there's only one God, and it's me. This is what he says. I am Yahweh, your God, who saved you. And then there's a bunch of knots right after this. I love... When I talk to people about Jesus, I love saying, my faith is not a faith that is, you can't do this, 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 and this. It's about you can have real and full life. But in these words, in the Old Testament, after he says, I am Yahweh, your God, the first word of all the next statements is lo, which is not. 
Not, you will do this. Not, you will do this. Not, you will do this. They are negatives and they are strong. You will not have any other gods except me. I'm the only God for you. I am the only God for you. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or under the sea, which they did shortly after this. They made a golden calf to worship. But part of the reason for saying this is because there was already an image of God that existed, and it was humanity. We are the image of God. Not that others will worship, but we, in our fullness, are supposed to reflect who he is and what he's made. There is no need to make other images of God, but then you will worship. Because there is an image of God, and that was his design all along. You must not bow down to them, other gods or idols, or worship them, which they did anyway, over and over again. It's almost like he knew what was going to happen. For I, Yahweh, am a jealous God, and I will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. The significant thing here, I think, is that Yahweh himself speaks to his people, and he gives them his name. My husband, who has been in youth ministry for a very long time, and often talks to leaders about the importance of learning kids' names, says it's because the sweetest word in the English language is your own name. When someone calls you by name, it's a very, very sweet thing. And I am terrible at remembering names. I love Name Tag Sunday, even though I don't wear one. Um, I have a hard time remembering names. But when someone calls you by name, especially when it's a child, have you ever had a young child who is not your child remember you and go, hi, Crystal? It's like, my day could finish now. I am so happy. They're happy to see me, and they know my name. What an amazing thing. In the ancient Near Eastern world, true names of mysterious things like gods were powerful. They were often viewed as being magical and mysterious. And if you knew the true name of something, then you could potentially tap into the power and the magic of it and use it for your own gain and your own ends. You see this show up in a lot of fantasy fiction today. It's because it's such an old and ancient idea. If you learn the true name of something. And so I think when God says, don't misuse the name of Yahweh, which is how it is written here, don't misuse Yahweh's name. When I grew up, that meant that if you said, and pardon me right now as I'm going to say it, it meant that if you said, oh my God, you were in a lot of trouble. Some of you maybe grew up in a home like that. If you said, oh my gosh, you were almost in a lot of trouble as well. Gal was just as bad. You couldn't just change the last letter and be okay. That was how it was often interpreted. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's good for us to use our words carefully because they're powerful. But in this context... It means I have given you my true name. You know my essence. Do not even think of trying to tap into that and using it magically for your own ends. I am here for you. You do not do that. I gave you my name, I think Yahweh would say, because I love you and because I want you to know me. It is the sweetest name when you call me by name, it is sweet. I think it's sweet for me to know that Jesus knows that I am Crystal. And I think for me to know his name is Jesus, Yeshua, and that God's name is Yahweh is a sweet, sweet thing. And then there's this weird thing in here about the Sabbath. What do we do with this? Is this for us today? Because if you turn back a few chapters, it doesn't just say, Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It says if you desecrate it or work on it, then you're going to be stoned to death, in which case we can bid our pastoral staff farewell and all the people in the sound booth and people downstairs working in Sunday school. We all work on the Sabbath. If we're parents, we are parenting. And in case you didn't know it, that's a lot of work. We're cooking. We're making our beds. We're driving to church. Sometimes we're doing the things that we don't have time to do during the week. What does this mean for us today? Does the law, the command, the word that says, if you desecrate the Sabbath and if you do work on it, you will either be stoned to death or you will be cut off from the community. 
Is that true for us today? Things get pretty tangled when you start looking at them carefully. And I don't think that's bad. I don't think we should be afraid of the Old Testament. But they do get tangled. What does it mean for us today? Some people think that we should discard the Old Testament. There's been a lot of brouhaha in the last couple of weeks about whether we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. And if you haven't entered the brouhaha, don't worry, you haven't missed that much except for a very lively conversation on Twitter. Should we unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament? Because, let's be honest, God in the Old Testament is kind of confusing. Sometimes people feel like he misbehaves a lot, that he's mean and angry, and that none of it makes any sense for us today or is relevant. And I don't think that's the answer. I, I don't believe that there's any way that could be the answer. This is, let's not call it the Old Testament, this is the First Testament. And so it is by necessity part of the story of those of us who follow the Second, the New, the Next Testament. So I don't think the answer is that we discard what's in the Old Testament. But I don't know that the opposite is true either, which is that we read the Old Testament as though all those words are written to us. They were written to a certain group of people, but they are still for us. But maybe not as they were originally spoken, because our context is different. We live in a different time. And we live under the blood of Christ, which changes everything. And here's the reason I say that. I think that anybody could follow the first four things that I read to you today. I think anybody could go, okay, I'm not going to make any graven images. I'm not going to bow down to them. I'm not going to worship any other gods. And I'm not going to work on the Sabbath. So I'm good. That's really all you'd have to do for these words to be for you. But when you get to the New Testament, the Second Testament, you find out that really what we're being asked to do is much, much more than that. Much more. We're not just being asked to serve him above all other gods. We're being asked to surrender our entire life to him. He doesn't just say in the New Testament, don't build any idols or graven images. In the New Testament says, you can't have any idols in your life, even if they're not a thing, an icon, something you can look at. If it's an attitude or a belief or a theory or a philosophy that you worship, you can't have that. The New Testament pushes these rules even further. He doesn't just say in the New Testament that he's jealous of other gods. He's jealous of everything we find out. He desires us to love him above all things, not just above the other gods, above everything. The way that you love God, in comparison, it should make the love that you have for your mother or your father or your spouse or your children look like hatred because your love for him is so deep. If the old words of God say, love me above all other gods, I think we could do that because I could go, well, I don't have any other gods that I love, so I can do that. But if in the New Testament he says, you have to love me more than everything, this is a much deeper commitment on my part. It's a relationship that is a much deeper level. And in terms of the Sabbath, he doesn't just say, keep the Sabbath holy and remember me, like he does in the Old Testament. He says, you be holy. Don't just keep the Sabbath holy. You be holy and remember me at all times. And Jesus explains that the Sabbath is created for us. It's a gift to us. We're not created to worship the Sabbath and make sure that we're doing or not doing certain things. It's made for us so that we will stop and remember. And sometimes we have to stop and remember while we're working as we parent or while we're working as we are doing whatever the things are that we do on a Sabbath. But continuously throughout the week, we can Sabbath with God by remembering who he is and that he has made us holy. See, here's what happened with the people of Israel. They did nothing to deserve having Yahweh as their God. Nothing. He chose them. 
And then they did nothing to be set apart. He gave them a new status without them doing anything. You are my people. I am setting you apart as a royal priesthood, a royal nation, as Ralph said last week. You are my image and representative on earth. I am giving you that status. And now here's how you're going to live into that identity. But you don't earn the status. I give it to you. These words were not written to us, but they are for us, for sure. They reveal God's careful, gentle, intentional, relevant revelation of himself to his specific people. And they show and remind us that he chooses people and gives them a new status by his good grace only because he decides that. And they lay the groundwork for Christ coming to complete this with a much bigger law and much deeper expectations. And there were people who kept these Ten Commandments perfectly. Even the rich young ruler, I've I've done them all. And then Jesus says, ah, but do you love me more than even your money? And the Pharisees who kept these, I mean, Jesus never accused them of not keeping the ten words. It was their heart that wasn't right, and that's what we're called to. So are these ten words for us? Yes, but they are just a start. They are not all that is for us. They do not stand alone. In my hand, I have a driver's contract for blank, blank, Kurgis, one of our sons. This contract is intended for the safety of blank, blank, Kurgis, and it's also intended for blank, blank, Kurgis to prove himself trustworthy and responsible as a driver. And there are eight words. We should have done ten, Mark. It would have been so much more biblical. There's eight. (laughs) And at the end, this child had to sign it and agree to the things that were on here. Are these still for him today? Well, there's great stuff in here. I'll wear my seatbelt all the time. I will be home at a decent hour. I will drive carefully. I will not break the law. I will not speed, right? I will not use the car to do things that my parents haven't said I could use the car for. This is a good document that still has a lot of wisdom in it. But where this young man is today is much deeper because now he has to buy a car and he has to buy insurance. And if something goes wrong, he's responsible for fixing it. And he's not just responsible for himself, he's responsible for the other people in his car. It has gone much deeper. And I love having this because it reminds me of where my kids came from and because there's good things in here that I hope we did this right. These words are still to him and for him. But if this is all that he does as a driver now, he's not getting it. He's not fulfilled what he's called to do or be as a driver. So for just a minute... I would like us to think about the first few words of God for us. And I want to be careful here because I think sometimes the mistake we make is we read the Bible and we're always like, What's the, what is the um, practical application for me? And I think sometimes the practical application is that you spent time reading God's word and got to know him a little better, and that's plenty. In fact, that's more than any of us deserve. But let's think about what these words written to people thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago might be for us today. Did I keep hitting this button during the thing and so it was moving backwards? Will you take out your bulletin? If you have a pen, you can do this with a pen. Otherwise, you can just do it thinking. We'll just spend a moment on this. God said to the Israelites, I am Yahweh, your God. But because of the New Testament and because of what Jesus did, we know that what that same God would say to us today is, I am Abba Father. And it's a plural pronoun here, all y'all's God. Who, and in these words, rescued you from slavery, brought you out of Egypt. But if this were written for Riverside Covenant today, or for you personally, or both, What would it say? I am Abba Father, all y'all's God, and your God, and your God, and your God. Who, what is the thing about him that describes where you have come from? Just take a moment and think about that. You don't have to write anything down, but you might write down one or two things. Who rescued you from a life of chasing meaningless things? 
who brought you out of a family that didn't love the Lord, but now you do? Who showed you the larger purpose? Who called you to live real life, not earthly life? I don't know, but something, because these words are still true. I am Abba Father, all y'all's God, and your God. Who, what? And what about the last word that we read today about the Sabbath? The Sabbath, says Jesus in the New Testament, was made for us. We were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for humanity, including me, so that, what? So that I would just slow down and remember who I am, so that I wouldn't get caught up in the ridiculous, ridiculous, mindless rush of trying to succeed. How does the Sabbath serve you? How was the Sabbath made for you? Each one of us needs it, probably for some of the same reasons, but individually as well. What is it that you need from a time of Sabbath, of stopping and remembering? Because God made the Sabbath for all of us, but he made it for each of us also. He knows why we need it. Do you know why you need it? Think carefully and be honest, because I'm not sure any of us is willing to admit how much we need the Sabbath, because we're pretty sure we've got things figured out on our own. Thank you very much. I am Yahweh, your God. I speak to you. I give you my name. Eventually, I give you my son. That's who I am. And because you know me, you can fully be you. But make sure that you are regularly stopping and resting and remembering not just to keep the Sabbath because it is holy, but to be holy, because that is who I have made you. That is the status I've given you. Now you live into that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are so good. And words, your words, are so powerful. I pray that today in the busyness that is often our Sundays, that we would intentionally Sabbath with you and that we would remember that you are Yahweh, our God, who has called us from nothing to everything, from death to life. That is who we are because that is who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.